As you saw in the video, we talked about a little bit of this. I'll summarize what we talked about last week. Dr. Luke, a companion of Paul, uh, the general uh, opinion is that Paul was in prison at this time uh, of the writing of these books in Caesarea Maritimus on the coast. It was kind of the capital of the region. And so whoever was the regional leader, and that changed uh, several times, uh, Roman consuls and proconsuls were, were the ones who had done it. Um, he, Paul was in prison. And so during that time, he gets a commission from a guy named Theophilus. And you see that in both books. Theophilus means God lover. And so um, Theophilus uh, gives money and provides money so that Dr. Luke can go do some research on this Jesus movement, who Jesus was and what he began to do and what we're going to find out and what he continues to do in this book. And he's collecting data as a defense for Paul when he, he's going to end up before Caesar in Rome. And so he's collecting all the data and putting it together so that that can be used for Paul's defense and ends up also being part of our defense as well. So when you read all of Paul's letters, you can kind of insert them into different places in the book of Acts because it gives us a bigger picture on what's going on as each of those letters is being written. Again, so Luke researches and writes these two books. The first of them is the gospel, often called the gospel according to Paul, because it's really he's writing on behalf of Paul. And uh, he says it's the work that Jesus began to do on earth. That was what the gospel was. And that book ends in Jerusalem with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Part two of what he's writing is the, the Acts and it's a continuation of Jesus's work, but this time, not through his physical body, but through the spiritual body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're just getting to that place where that Holy Spirit is given so that they can pay attention to that. It picks up where the gospel left off in Jerusalem, and then it goes from there to the ends of the earth. So Luke was very geographical in getting Jesus to Jerusalem, and now uh, Acts is the opposite. It goes from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth from there. So last week, Jesus handed off his mission to the disciples and told them to wait in Jerusalem for the power to actually accomplish that mission. So they're waiting. And on the day of Pentecost, it happens. So Acts chapter two is we're going to be, begin today. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, everybody, the assumption is that they were in the upper room. I'll, I'll tell you a couple reasons in a little bit why I, I don't think that was it. I'm going to say they were probably in the temple worshiping. Uh, they were gathered there in the temple every morning for prayer. This was, was their pattern. and uh, But we'll talk about that in just a moment. Verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to rest on each of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the tongues as the Spirit had given them utterance. So the power that Jesus had promised now was coming to them to accomplish the mission. Because remember back in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he says, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on a high. This is the fulfillment of that promise that Jesus made. So now Jesus's mission was now their mission. He's handed it off to them. We'll continue in verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men and women from every nation under heaven. Now remember, this is Pentecost. This is one of the three high holidays in Judaism that required at least the men to come to the city. And of course, they often brought their wives and kids along with them. But at least the men were required to come from, the, uh, from wherever they lived in the world. They were, come, they were required to come for this festival. So People from all over the known world at the time were gathering in the city of Jerusalem. And at this sound, the multitude came together. What's the sound? Well, the sound is possibly the mighty rushing wind. It's also, you have at least 120 people speaking in all these different languages at once. So there's a, a little bit of uh, kind of chaos going on in, in that as well. But as I said to you last week, and I mentioned to you earlier, I don't think they're in the upper room. None of the, the upper room doesn't make sense in the story that we're about. Because if you're in an upper room, because remember, it's on the upper room is on Mount Zion, which is on the other side of the city. It's in a quiet place. If they're in an upper room in a quiet place, this sound and 120 people making all that noise doesn't make sense. 
But if you pay attention, one, we know that they were in the temple every morning at nine o'clock for prayers. That's where they go. It's a high holiday. So they would be there. Uh, we know it's nine o'clock because we're going to hear about that in just a little bit ago. And, and it also says there's thousands of people. We know that several thousand are going to come to Jesus. So there's thousands more that are present. It makes sense that this was at the temple mounts. And then let me show you just physically where I think they were as well. So if you go to this first screen, do you see, can you see the, the, the screen? So that's the Herod's temple. And uh, if you can't see it, you can use the U version. You can see it on there as well. Um, so on the far, on my side of the screen, there's that long red roofed building that's there. That's called Solomon's Portico or Solomon's Porch. And that whole area, if we go to the next screen, was this massive colony that was underneath. And it's this place that the rabbis would gather with their students in these little, in these halls in different places. They'd all sit down. This is probably where Jesus and, and was meeting with them when he was 12 and they came and they found him in the temple. This is the, this big long colonnade is where all the rabbis would teach their students and stuff like that. So we think that they were in regularly when they gathered in the temple courts. They didn't go to the, the main temple all the time. They would do that for sacrifices and stuff like that. But when they would gather for worship and stuff like that, they would do it in this space. This is where that would happen in the colonnades that were there. Now, this is like being, have you ever been in a big uh, uh, church or a big uh, cathedral or something like that? What happens when you whisper? It echoes, right? There's all that, all the those columns and everything like that. You hear the echo. Now imagine if there's 120 people there and uh, this rushing wind, uh, just think of the Santa Ana winds rushing, that sound coming from these, it would echo through those chambers. If you've been in a, it can be a, a cathedral or something like that, or a big tunnel when winds come through and there's, you hear the noise of, of the wind passing through. Not only that, but then you have this 120 people that are, they're speaking in tongues. They're doing all of this kind of, so you can hear the echoing and stuff that would go on there. And then there's thousands of pilgrims that are out on this. You can see just past that. You can see the main temple on the other side, just through the pillars. All those people are out there going through the court of Gentiles on the way over to the temple itself. So there's thousands of people gathered. So this is ripe location for this to happen. Plus, I'm going to tell you a little bit later, they're going to baptize 3,000 people. You can't do that in an upper room. Yes. Yes. Well, it's, it was built. Well, so th that's a whole different story location wise. Yeah. 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 We can get into the archeology span that come to the Israel trip next year. You'll be able to see, see, we'll go to that place and I'll show you why I do believe it's the location of the upper room. I don't believe it's the day of Pentecost that was there. Okay. So um, anyway, so this is, I think that's where they were just outside these steps as you enter into here would be all of the mikvahs, the Jewish ritual baths that people would have had to take in their bath to prepare. So there's all this water and all there's literally a place it's called now it just recently opened. It's called the, the path of the mikveh because there's hundreds of these mikveh, these watering holes just outside the temple just outside there's steps that go right outside these columns there's steps that go down to it through a place called the hold the gates and that's a whole i'm getting too deeply into this by the way uh, but anyway there's all that place for this that's why i believe that that this happens so, so all of that's happening so it makes sense that they were in the temple when the day of pentecost and the temple is called the house it's the house of the lord and so when you hear the verse and it says they were in the house together that's i believe what what it's saying so Verse six continues. There's this, these crowds are coming because they're hearing all this noise. It makes sense that it's there, not on some little narrow street, someplace, you'd, you know, it's, it's in this place. The crowds were bewildered, verse six, because each one was hearing them speak his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not these all who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us his own native language? Aren't they Galileans? Aren't these just ordinary guys. In fact, they're Galilean guys. So they're like subordinary guys or super ordinary guys. They're just fishermen from the Galilee. These are just, how is this happening from them? That's what we're focusing on, right? God's going to use who you are. And, and, and here's another thing that I think is interesting because if, if someone is speaking your language that you don't know, that's interesting, but that's not a miracle. I think the miracle is whatever language that they are speaking, and I do believe they're prophesying and stuff, it may even have been the language of angels that they were speaking. It's the miracle was not in their speaking the language, the miracle was in the fact that people were hearing the messages in their own languages. 
So there could have been multiple people hearing the same message, but in different languages. I think that's the miracle that we're listening to at that time. So, uh, so how many languages? So the next screen, I think, has a list of languages. It says there were Parthians, verse 9, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors to Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arab, Ar Arabians. Um, that's 16 different locations that I, I count. I think it's very interesting. If you look back, it says the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. I think the reason that they're putting these names down is because they're thinking of specific people. Bob was from Libya, but not just like Libya. He was part of the, in Cyrene, that was a part of Libya. That's the part that he was from. I think they were listing specific locations that people that actually made decisions to follow Jesus came at that because there's people from way more places than that, but there's at least 16 places that they're counting here. And it says, we hear them telling in our own tongues, the mighty works of God. Again, so these Jews are gathering from all over the known world at the time, right? And uh, they're, they're coming from nations where their native tongue is not Hebrew. They're coming from nations that are, if they're from Rome, their main language is Latin. If they're coming from Libya or Arabia, it's Arabian or Macedonian, or it's all these other languages. They may worship in Hebrew, which is kind of their second language, but so like up until 1962, all Roman Catholics worshiped in Latin, but that, that just meant you went and you watched it happen, but you didn't necessarily, you might've known a few of the words that were happening, but you just, you knew that what was supposed to happen and what your part was in it, but you didn't necessarily understand all the words. And that's how a lot of these people came to Jerusalem from all these parts of the world. They understood the ceremony, they understood what was happening, but they weren't able to engage in the specific words of, of what was going on. So, cause they're foreigners, this is not their home base. They probably knew a couple Hebrew words and stuff like that as, along the way, but all of a sudden in the temple where they're worshiping, they have someone speaking their language and explaining, because I think that's what's going on. We hear prophesying. What did they say? What were the words? We don't know specifically, but we hear them say, and we're going to hear in the verses that follow, there was a lot of prophesying that God was going to give them the gift to do. So I think there's, and when I say prophesying, it's not about future events. It's interpreting scripture and helping people to understand the meaning of scripture and, and how that was going at the time. So th these people all of a sudden, I think are amazed that, oh, here's someone that speaks my language. I can, I can, there's a connection. And so there's, there's that going on. Plus they're hearing it, but that's not the words they're speaking and all this. So there's all that kind of stuff that's going on in the midst of, of that. And uh, it continues in chapter 12. And all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking them saying they are filled with new wine. They're drunk. Because if you don't understand the other languages, you just hear that gibberish. If you've never heard Mesopotamian or if you've never heard Libyan or Cyrenian or, you know, some of these other languages, it can sound like gibberish to you. And so, like, you know, I think we've probably all seen far too many uh, people under the influence of something that that speak an unintelligible <laughs> language, right? So, so it's very easy to understand that they may have been uh, drunk. And again, uh, we don't know what they are saying, but my guess is that they're prophesying because of this. And listen to what Peter says. Um, Peter comes up and uh, he steps up to the bike for the group in verse 14 and says, and again, the great thing about this, this great cathedral of a building, it was four football fields long. Those, if you think about how long those that colonnade was, so you can, it's a massive building. And if you're a teacher and you stand up to speak, it echoes. So it's a great place for, for them to be teaching. So he stands up and he lifts up in his voice to address them. This is the, you know, here's, there's 19 sermons in the books of book of Acts. So this is the first of 19 sermons we're going to cover over this next year. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ears to my words. These people are not drunk as you suppose since it is, since it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Remember, I told you that's where they were supposed to be, nine o'clock in the morning. That's when, that's when worship happened. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So he talks about one of the prophecies. And in the last days, 
It shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I shall pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. That's why I'm thinking that that was what was going on in, in that time or what they were saying. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen to that, right? Yahweh promised, this is the point, Yahweh promised this day would happen. What does Yahweh mean? The God who always was and always will be the same. He keeps his promise. His name is his promise. So men of Israel, hear my words, he continues. Jesus of Nazareth, a man tested to you, attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. There, that's one that you need to highlight or underline or however it is you take notes in your Bibles. According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, because he's about to say that something that's going to make them feel you know, like he's pointing a finger at him, but he's saying this was the plan of God. This is not something outside of the plan of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of law this man. You did it, but it was a part of God's plan. This is the way God planned it. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David in Psalm 16, verse eight says, concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make full of gladness. Uh, you will make me full of your gladness with your presence. He's quoting them. And then he says, brothers and sisters, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day, right across town. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God raised up, and we are all witnesses. He's saying all of them that are standing there testifying the, the miracle that you're seeing with them speaking all these languages, they're all witness of this, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You want to know what all this noise is about? You want to know what all this weird stuff is going on? It's because of the power of Jesus. It's, it's connected. He's, they're giving praise back to Jesus again. It's because he is the one, is the, the reason for this all happening. Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of, the, of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this is because uh, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Now, now pay attention. This was Peter. Do you remember what we know about Peter up to this point? Denying, hiding, lying, bull in a china shop kind of a guy, right? Up, up to this point, but an ordinary fisherman from Galilee. And yet, here he is in the temple of God at one of the high holy days in Israel. And he is saying, what, what happened to Peter? It's what's happening to all of them. The Holy Spirit has now come and, and, and is now residing in each one of them. And so you are seeing Peter's life change as it's happening in the moment that it's happening. Here's the powerful thing. And here's another thing why I think it's so amazing. In the, the Old Testament, when the Shekinah glory of God was present, it was present in the tabernacle as what? Fire and, and the, the pillar of smoke at night or the pillar of smoke in the daytime and the, the fire that appeared over the tabernacle, right? And then when Solomon dedicated the temple, the Shekinah glory of God came upon the temple. And then, so, and we see God's, there's another story of God's glory leaving the temple, which is a whole powerful and very sad story, but that's not it. But it's always in the temple. They're in the courts of the temple. And when God's Shekinah glory comes down in the fire again at that point, where does it show? It doesn't go on the big temple. It moves over to the other side of the courts 
on all the small, all individuals, that same pillar of fire then appears over the heads of the people. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's a pretty incredible thing. In the very same location, God just kind of moves over uh, his location. And he's doing it on Peter. We see this life change coming through Peter. Peter's message is super simple. Basically, Jesus's death and resurrection was promised. And uh, his promised power that came, the Holy Spirit, is the thing that has manifest. These things that you're seeing happen are because of the Holy Spirit. That was promised. Verse 38. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Now, repent is not stop doing something. It's not stop smoking. It's not stop cussing. It's not stop sinning. Repent means change your mind. Change your mind about who God is. Change your mind about the God who allows you to do those things and understand that the God who calls you is the God who's holy and he's called you to a different lifestyle. And so change your mind. So worship the God that, that scripture talks about, not the, word, the God that expects religion, but the God who expects relationship. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift that you're hearing, that you're seeing, that you're seeing this manifestation of for the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word and were baptized and there were about that day, about 3,000 souls. So imagine, they walked, they went to worship that morning with about 120 of them and their little family. By the end of the day, they've got 3,000 people that are, can you imagine? I mean, 120 people isn't a small group, but you got 3,000 people. So, so they've got some things to do. Um, they, they've got some things to figure out. They were gathering in their homes just like we do. But, but they were only 120 people, so it's easy to spread up and go up into different homes and stuff like that and gather in the courts together and worship together. But now there's 3,000 people, one, 3,000 people, two, from all over the world, three, they're going home in a couple days. Do you see the problem? How do they go home and know what to do when they get home? How are they going to understand how are they going to, how are they going to do this? So here's a, here's a circle your chair with someone for just a couple minutes. And what would you do if it was you, what would be your plan on discipling people in a couple days? What would be most important? So turn around and talk to them for just a couple minutes. Okay, what would you do? I told you it was going to be short. What would you do? Food was involved. There you go. Food's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so if, if, if heaven is about a big feast, 
if Jesus's table is about a big feast, you know that the mission is about a big feast, right? All right. So it's got to be food. Yes. Teach them how to pray. All right. Okay. Tell your story. Yep. Teach them how to, like, how does their story intersect with God's story, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. So, so go back to the food again. Everybody eats. So what's the difference? Why, why would you teach them how to eat? How to do it together, right? Yeah. Yeah. How that, how that food is a part of the kingdom picture, right? All right. So let's, let's get into the text and see what they did. Acts chapter two, verse 42. So you have all these people. So th these people are going to leave. So the time frame is short. How long are they going to stay? Some, some of them probably said, hey, I can postpone my trip home for a month. Some said, you know, I got to get home. I've got to meet with Caesar. I've got, you know, whatever, I, whatever their time frame is. So they've got a short period of time with them. So what did they do? They devoted themselves, circle devoted. You need to read. That's a word that we need to pay attention to. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. So whether that was the context of the actual words of the apostles teaching, or if that was the actual apostles doing the teaching, we don't know, but, but it was apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread, meals together, and to prayers. Uh, they did what was important to pass on. What they felt was important, they modeled it for them. They didn't, they didn't sit them down and have a seminar on Jesus 101. They sat them down, and they, they, they actually just did it together, what they thought was important. They gathered together for worship, for fellowship, so, so you don't have to worship all the time. I mean, that's part of the fellowship, right? That's what happens when you gather together. And they, they grew through teaching. Uh, but but they, and here's the thing. They just didn't gather because it was convenient. They didn't gather because the weather was good. They didn't gather just because it says they, they it, you know, it wasn't just a, you know, I'm tired today. I'm not going to go today. I'm, you know, there's a big football game on, so I'm not going to go gather today, or I have a birthday party I got to get to. It says they were devoted to the gathering for these reasons, because me being a part of that is important. If you're a mature person, you need to be there because the immature piece, people need you there. If you're an immature person in faith, you need to be there because you need to learn from the mature. We need the body to gather together. They were devoted and they understood that the success of the mission was dependent on them gathering together. They were devoted to it. Some people say they don't need to, you know, be a part of a congregation to worship Jesus. And technically that's true. You can worship Jesus on your own. We can do that. In fact, we should do that on our own. But you can't succeed in your mission alone. You can't succeed in the mission that Jesus has called you. You're not just here to worship. You know, that's the problem. The theology that says I can do it on my own says that's all that God's called me to. Well, that's the that's a problem. He didn't save you just so you can worship. He could get that anywhere. Otherwise, he'd just take us all to heaven when, we, when we, he saved us so he could leave us here to finish the work that he completed. So we need to be devoted to gathering together with the body. And that's why we asked you to be a part of the covenant that you sign up to be a part of one of our, one of our missional communities. And it, it's how these priorities play out in our body life here. Verse 43 says, and, and this is a verse I think I just need to pray and think through. This is such a powerful verse. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon every soul. There was, this was, there have been moments of awe, but this seems like it is like the culture of awe that they are living in. And, and I would love to be a part of that. But they also gathered to give, verse 44. And all who believed were together, had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as the, any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. These are, this, is their, this, is their, this is their first pastor's conference, missionary conference. This is what they're doing. They're feeding the people that are going to leave, that don't have homes. They're going to be leaving soon. So they're gathering together. They're, they're being generous together, praising God and having favor with all the people. The, the interesting thing is the general population of Jerusalem, believers or not, liked them. 
there was something about this sharing, loving community as they manifest the, the, the power of the kingdom that the community looked at them and said, those are good people. That's, that's the kind of thing that they wanted to be a part of. So the Lord added to their day, their number day by day, all those who were being saved. The interesting thing about this passage is it doesn't focus. They were being led by the 12 apostles for sure. But the impression that, ha- that you get from this passage, there's, there's no apostle being highlighted. There's no uh, specific person that's being highlighted. The work is being done by all the average ordinary people, right? Everyone is just coming together and doing their part. There's no superstars just average Joes. Even the apostles, though, even if they were the superstars, they're just ordinary people. They're just ordinary guys. And and the the cool thing about this to me is they're like, well, that was the birth of the church. That was a special miraculous event. It never happens again. Well, I want to tell you this was their culture. Uh, Acts chapter 5 verse 42 says, day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 37, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of their the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. That's a super powerful statement. Just the implications of that are just mind-boggling. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and a great grace was upon them all. There was no, not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There's this great balance between teaching and social needs, right? There's not one that overrides the other. And sometimes we get so focused on one or the other that, that we miss the point. There's this great balance of the two. You can't do one without the other. So now what? Verse uh, 36 and 37 of Acts chapter 4 says, Thus Joseph, and I love this, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. This guy, his personality was such that what this ordinary guy brought to the table, first of all, was so much encouragement every time you saw him. We have people like that. You know them, right? You know them. In this, in this gathering, there are people that are Barnabases. I had a pastor yesterday. He texted me, and, and it was actually before I finished up my work on the message this, this morning, and he just texted me a message. And you know what? He does that every Saturday afternoon. He sends me a text message of a prayer and a scripture uh, that he's praying for me. And I, yeah, right? And I said, you know what? I was actually just praying, Lord, thank you for this Barnabas in my life. And I opened up the scripture and I opened it up to Acts chapter 4, verse 36. And Joseph was called Barnabas. How cool is that? This guy's personality, what he brought to the table was so much so that it became his name. He was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, and he sold a field that belonged to him and brought it to the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he brought not only his personality as an encourager, but he also brought literally his his offerings like the things that he owned everyone brought what they brought or what they had they brought land they brought food some of you brought food today some of you didn't bring food doesn't matter you brought what you have you bring what you have some of that's just your smile they brought their skills they brought their ability to teach even like barnabas the gift of encouragement you bring your personality to the table one of the things that i think is beautiful in this passage yep Yep, he's going to be in the rest. He's going to play a bigger part later in the book. So as we pay attention to what's happening in this context, they're still gathering at the temple. They're still Jewish boys and girls gathering, doing what good Jewish boys and girls are doing. They're still living their cultural. They didn't, they didn't, the gospel is not asking them to change their ordinary life, but to empower their ordinary life, which included their culture. They, other people that are going to come along are not going to be asked to give up their culture in order to follow Jesus. They're not going to be asked to become Jewish. You're not asked to change your culture to become Jewish in the same, or to become a Christ follower. And the same is true for the rest of us, whether we're Chinese or Scottish or Mexican or Filipino or whatever your culture is, you're not asked to give up your culture in order to come and follow Jesus. Jesus wants to take your culture and empower with it the Holy Spirit so that you can go back to your culture and be a missionary, because that's what we're about to see happen. 
all these people gathered in Jerusalem are going back to Rome. They're going back to Arabia. They're going back to Macedonia and all those other places. They're going back. They shouldn't go back with a different culture because then they're going to be irrelevant to their people. But God wants to superpower your culture as a tool for the kingdom. So I asked you at the beginning, what's in your hands? Maybe close your eyes and just open your hands and just ask the Holy Spirit that, Lord, what's in my hands? I didn't ask you if you had anything in your hands, but I said, what are, what are the tools that you have for your mission? Some of that is your personality. Some of you are extroverts. Some of you are introverts. Some of it is your gifts. Some of it is your musical talents. Some of it is your financial knowledge. Some of it is your finances. But all of it is your ordinary you. You are God's tool for his mission. And the question that each of us has to come to is what are we doing with it? And can we MacGyver those tools in our lives that are in our hands, whatever they are, for something useful for the kingdom? So as we recognize what those are, and maybe you don't know, maybe that's your prayers. We go into worship. Maybe your prayers, the Holy Spirit, teach me what are the tools that are in my, in my hands? I'll tell you one, it's at the location of where you live, your house. Now there's your job, your family, your relationships. Those are all gifts. Those are all part of the tools that God has given you. And so the question then becomes with what's in our hands, are we willing to lay those down for Jesus, for his purposes? Can we bring them to the table like the early disciples did? Or, and here's the humbling part, are we just squandering those gifts on ourselves? And we're going to learn how that plays out later. We'll, we'll talk about that because that is an example that's here. So the big question, though, is are you devoted to the mission of a local body? To Jesus's teaching on Sundays, to fellowship in community, to discipleship, in our context, in a DNA group? Uh, are you devoted to the mission within the context of the community? Are you devoted to prayer? Those are the things the early church felt import was important, and those are the things we feel are important. By the way, again, just as a reminder, Monday night we have prayer over at Friends Church with all the churches around the county. You can join us for that. So, Father, we take these things that are in our hands, and I do pray that your spirit would reveal to us maybe even some things that we didn't recognize were gifts. You know, sometimes an illness is a gift, and God can use your illness for his purposes. Your children are a gift. There are so many things. Lord, Holy Spirit, show us the gifts and give us the courage to offer them back to you so that we could be just what you've called us to be, ordinary people on an extraordinary mission. We love you in Jesus' name.